Welcome, I'm Country Boy, and this is One Mike Black History. This episode is about the demise of the Black Panther Party. If you like this, please consider donating to our Patreon page. Also, if you like episodes like this, you can find us at onemikehistory.com. Please hit the subscribe button down in your right-hand corner, and also give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. After the Black Panthers' creation in 1966, during their initial years, the Black Panther Party grew from a small organization in Oakland to a national, even international organization. In turn, the Panthers created a tiered organizational structure to accommodate their rapid expansion. At the top, the Panthers' governing body, which was called the Central Committee of Black Panther founders, Huey P. Newton as Minister of Defense, Bobby Seale as Chairman, along with Minister of Information, Eldridge Cleaver, Deputy Minister of Information, Frank Jones, and Chief of Staff, David Hilliard. The Central Committee was always based in the National Headquarters in the Bay Area. At the intermediate level was the state and regional chapters such as Illinois, Maryland, and New York. The leaders of these chapters were either chosen or self-elected and confirmed by the chairman Bobby Seale or a representative of the national headquarters. These local branches represented the Panthers at the ground level. Then there were the rank and file members which would report to the branches or the chapter leaders depending on the party's organizational development in the specific geographical area. And at the very bottom were community workers and they were members of the black community that desired to be Black Panthers but were not official members. They often performed various duties such as selling Panther newspapers, working in the free breakfast program, and attending political education classes. Their status became more difficult to distinguish from the rank and file members after 1969 because of police infiltration made the party discontinue formally accepted new members. During this early period, the most prominent Panther, Huey P. Newton, did not directly participate in the building of the national organization of the Black Panther Party. The task was carried out by Bobby Seale, Edris Cleaver, and David Hilliard, and the state and local leaders throughout the country. And this was because Newton was arrested for murdering a police officer in Oakland, California in October of 1967, and was later convicted of voluntary manslaughter in September 1968. He would not be released from prison until August 1970 after his lawyers gained a new trial upon appeal. While in prison, Newton was a device for recruitment during the National Free Huey campaign. Newton would achieve almost mythical, legendary status among blacks and radical activists as a political prisoner during this time. While the Panthers were winning the hearts and minds of young African Americans who had grown impatient with the civil rights movement's emphasis on gradual legislative change, each Black Panther chapter had their own distinct political culture depending on their location. All Black Panther chapters were influenced by the founding members' principles and strict discipline. Members' opinions were sought out in a myriad of issues, but once decisions were made, they were implemented promptly and without question. The early Panthers armed patrols, the military experience of Bobby Seale and other members, and the Panthers' militant rhetoric gave the Panthers a paramilitary image and a commitment to disciplined action. The Panthers considered themselves at war with the oppressive capitalist state and the racist political system. And to ensure discipline, Panther leaders utilized corporal and other punishments when a party member violated party rules or risked the lives of another party member unnecessarily. In 1968, the party's membership drastically expanded nationwide following the death of Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Hutton, who was one of the first Black Panther members. In 1968, the summer's urban protests and rebellions, and by 1969, the Black Panther's presence was felt in almost every major city in the country. However, even during their peak period in 1968 through 1970 of the organization's membership, the party would lose members to government oppression, organizational purges, and attempt to weed out government government infiltrators. Also during this period, serious political and ideological differences would start to develop within the Panther Party. 
Panthers outside of California would complain about their lack of involvement in decision making at a national level. And after the violent confrontations with police officers, the National Party began to downplay self-defense and put a greater emphasis on community service programs. Especially the popular free breakfast program for children, the free health clinics, and the liberation schools. However, some Panthers in other parts of the country disagreed with these policies. Consequently, these internal conflicts were manipulated by the FBI, which led to a major divide within the organization. The 1968 through 1970 period culminated a series of Black Panther purges and expulsions, which were confirmed by Newton and the Central Committee in an attempt to weed out FBI infiltrators. As the Black Panthers attracted national attention, J. Edgar Hoover decided that they needed to be destroyed. The government attack on progressive and radical black groups such as the Black Panther Party was systematic and vicious. The Black Panther Party was a victim of almost 80% of the FBI's 295 authorized attacks on black political organizations. The FBI's covert action program against the Black Panther Party began in 1968 and would continue until 1971 when the Bureau allegedly terminated all of its counterintelligence programs against domestic groups because of its security leaks. As the Black Panther Party gained national and international prominence, the FBI attempted to promote violent conflicts between the Black Panther Party and other black power groups, encouraged Black Panther Party internal conflict, undermined the Black Panther support, and provoked local police attacks on the Black Panther Party. With such repressive tactics and instances, the FBI succeeded in neutralizing a lot of the Black Panther Party's political programs. The Black Panther Party was confronted with a comprehensive government repression that took many diverse forms. All Panther members were subject to police surveillance and harassment. Police regularly harassed both leadership and rank and file members. They issued parking and traffic citations for minors, even non-existent violations, and often arrested party members on trumped up charges. Court fines and traffic violations and unjustifiable arrests forced the Black Panthers to allocate time, money, and resources to legal matters rather than organizing in the Black community. During December of 1967 through December 1969, the party paid more than $200,000 in bond premiums, money that the Black Panther Party would never recover. During this period, at least 28 Black Panthers were killed. These were usually results of conflicts with local police or FBI-inspired inter-party conflicts or external conflicts with other Black power organizations. Consequently, the Black Panthers were often in a siege mentality and unsure who they could trust and unsure when they might be killed. To counter this onslaught of government repression, the Panthers developed several measures including purging suspected infiltrators, improving ties with traditional community groups, and intensifying its community survival programs. The Black Panther Party was the target of systematic and comprehensive political repression at all levels of the government. And despite this government repression, the Black Panther Party's first four years were the most successful in terms of growth in the chapters, membership effect and prestige. Perceived by African Americans as a fearless, radical political group, the Black Panther Party challenged and called the nation's attention to police brutality, poverty, socioeconomic inequality, and the Vietnam War. The Panther's success stemmed for fundamentally from its ability to inspire African American youth and young adults to work for the American people. But government repression wasn't the only issue facing the Black Panthers. The seeds of internal conflict had been planted after Huey Newton's release from prison in August 1970. Once a free man, Newton was working to attempt to strengthen the party's community service programs and to gain release of then-imprisoned Bobby Seale. Seale was in prison for 16 counts of contempt during his trial for inciting a riot at the 1968 Democratic Convention. At the same time, Eldridge Cleaver was in exile in Algeria because he had been brought up on charges of attempted murder during the death of Bobby Hutton. He was heading the international section of the Black Panther Party and Newton and Cleaver, two of the party's most prominent members and leaders of the Central Committee, had increasingly differed on strategy and tactics. Newton wanted to downplay self-defense and place confrontation and Cleaver wanted to advocate for violent revolution and guerrilla warfare. Cleaver failed to recognize, though, that the emphasis on militant action isolated 
isolated the Panthers from the community, thereby reinforcing their image of a gang of super revolutionaries. And on the other hand, Newton was unprepared and overwhelmed by the national organization that was built in his name. In late 1970, he had begun touring and speaking at major political events and visiting Black Panther chapters. As a public speaker, Newton greatly disappointed his followers. David Hilliard would later state that Newton didn't inspire his audience in the same manner that Cleaver, Seal, and other Black Panther leaders such as Chicago's Fred Hampton had done. Also, differences between the national headquarters and state chapters had also begun to manifest itself into conflicts. Friction between national headquarters and a New York chapter. The New York chapter was one of the largest in the country with smaller local branches in Harlem, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx, and other parts of the state. The New York chapter began to lodge several complaints against the national leadership while Newton was in prison. And New York leaders assumed that when Newton was released, that grievances would finally be addressed. But Newton's release only exacerbated the tensions between the New York chapter and national leadership. The New York leaders tended to agree with Cleaver that the party needed to emphasize militant action. However, other substantial disagreements also were readily apparent. The New York Panther leaders complained about the chapter's lack of representation and the Central Committee, and it hampered their local organizational efforts. The New York Panthers resented the national leadership's the emphasis of local organizing around housing issues and drugs in the black community. Instead, Oakland placed a greater emphasis on the free breakfast program, clothing, and health clinics. The New York leaders felt a lack of representation in the National Committee prevented the national leadership from appreciating the importance and distinction of their local issues. Disagreements over how material resources were distributed also fuel in a party strife. The Black Panther Party received funds from various resources such as lawyer groups, church organizations, community organizations, and individuals. And party leadership also raised funds via speaking engagements. The Black Panthers also received thousands of dollars from white, wealthy, sometimes famous supporters. The Panther chapters were required to contribute a percentage of paper sales and income to the national office for the overall organization. And increasingly, members of the Black Panther chapters felt exploited by the national National office. The party members became concerned when reports began to surface of Newton and other national leaders who were living in penthouse apartments and extravagant homes, and this caused the local chapters to resent the fact they felt their funds were being misrepresented. The party disputes culminated with government repression finally culminated in the splintering of the Black Panther Party. Newton, in the Central Committee's name, confirmed the expulsions of several well-respected party leaders. In 1971, Newton expelled Geronimo Pratt, Connie Williams, Michael Tabor, and Deroma Moore, as well as the entire New York chapter, then proclaiming they were enemies of the people. Several attempts to reverse those expulsions were ultimately unsuccessful. Eldridge Cleaver argued that the Central Committee's members should have been informed prior to the expulsions and Cleaver led a faction that argued for the reinstatement of the Purge Panther members. Newton and the national leadership will reject this view and on February 26, 1971, Newton and Cleaver agreed to discuss the party's differences during a local San Francisco television program in which Cleaver phoned in from Algeria. They promptly began arguing and expelled each other from the organization. This inner party strife continued throughout the year, and New York leadership, as well as various Panther members scattered across the nation, would align with Eldridge Cleaver. The Panthers' organizational conflict reached a deadly level when Robert Webb, a West Coast Panther member originally who sided with Cleaver and the New York Panthers, was murdered on March 8, 1971. Six weeks later, on April 17, 1971, Samuel Napier, the distributing manager of the Black Panthers, was tortured and killed in New York, allegedly in retaliation for Robert Webb's death. Both Napier and Webb were respected, beloved members of the Black Panther Party, and such destructive warfare created general fear within the party and prompted many Panther members to abandon the organization. According to Bobby Seal, approximately 30 to 40 percent of the Black Panthers left as a result of this internal conflict.
The intra-party conflict only assisted government officials dismantling of the Panthers. Cleaver and Newton would have no idea that the FBI initiated a program to divide the two Panther leaders. The FBI also conspired to permanently divide the New York chapter from the national headquarters. And years later, Newton would reflect on the government's successful attempt to divide the party. In conducting research for his 1980 doctoral dissertation, Newton discovered that for three solid weeks, a barrage of anonymous letters flowed in from the FBI's headquarters. In late 1970, early 1972, after Newton and Seal regained control of the party and intensified and expanded their involvement in the black community, new Black Panther programs would form, including the Samuel Napier's Youth Intercommunal Institute, the Free Brussing to Prisons Program, the Free Clothing Program, and the George Jackson Free People's Medical Research Clinic. In the early days, the Black Panthers' little local leaders developed their own contacts and relationships with various institutional and local individual supporters. Consequently, despite the lack of representation on the Central Committee, they maintained relative autonomy based on their personal contacts and distance from the national headquarters. But in 1972, Newton would require that all money coming into the party go directly to him, and he would distribute it to the Black Panthers' relevant program as he saw fit. Newton created several corporate entities to store the Panthers' money, and he diverted money from the Panther programs to support his personal activities. The Panther parties tended to accept this centralization of money and power because they worshipped Newton as their leader. In 1972, the Black Panthers attempted to concentrate their power into Huey Newton's hands. The party decided to mount a campaign to capture Oakland's mayoral and other local offices. Toward this goal, the Central Committee agreed to close all local chapters outside of Oakland in order to support Bobby Seale's mayoral candidacy. In an attempt to prevent more state rebellions and increase the Black Panthers' power within Oakland, Newton represented the local committee with two bold ideas. Bobby Seale should run and lead a full slate of Panther candidates for local offices and the mayor of Oakland, and two, that the party should close all Panther chapters outside of Oakland and redeploy all Panthers and their resources to Oakland to work on a campaign and consolidate the power of the Black Panthers in its birthplace. Newton's proposal reflected his evolving ideas on the ideas of power. At the party's founding, he and CEO related power to the use of political violence. Consequently, they adopted Mao Zedong's credo that political power comes from the barrel of a gun. As a result of Newton's studies in prisons, fatal path of shootouts with police, and in, in the recent internal party strife, Newton's ideas of the party had evolved, and Newton's new thinking as that the party needed to give more serious attention attention to political and economic dimensions of power and de-emphasize their earlier militant focus. Newton believed that if the party gained political control in Oakland, they could promote an ambitious economic development program that included turning the city's ports into a highly profitable state-of-the-art facility, promoting local black businesses, implementing new social service programs. The Central Committee enthusiastically supported the idea of acquiring power within Oakland but were divided on the necessity of dismantling the national organization. Chairman Bobby Seale led the opposition of breaking down the chapters on strategic and tactical grounds. Strategically, he saw no need to take this action because the party was already strong in Oakland and had excellent local supporters. Tactically, Bobby Seale resonated that the national headquarters lacked the resources to receive thousands of members from across the country on a very short notice. More importantly, the party had an organizational commitment and existing service programs in operation across the country. According to Seal, the party could not fold those chapters. Andrea Jones, the former chapter leader, would state on closing the chapters. I think it was a major mistake. It was a national organization with viable structures and communities, and people felt abandoned by that. There was a great support of the party in the local chapters and branches, and people put themselves out to take part in that. And the closing down of clinics and the closing down of the breakfast programs meant that the whole idea of the organization, to an extent, these things were taken over, and it felt like there was a hole left. 
a large contingent of Black Panthers outside of the Bay Area shared in Bobby Seale's opinion. When membership received a new directive from the Central Committee, many members refused to uproot their lives and move thousands of miles away from home. These party members simply just left the Black Panthers. The Black Panther leaders in various state organizations expressed misgivings on the Central Committee's directive to close their respective party units. And in addition to running communal programs, they had Panther members in jail and on trial for various charges who required legal assistance. On the positive side, many members were happy to get to know and finally work with party members from around the country. And this infusion of new energy reinvigorated the party in the Bay Area's community service programs. Members also benefited from ideological and political training provided by the national leadership. On the negative side, though, the Panthers new to the Bay Area were disappointed by the intellectual capacity and lack of preparation of various national leaders who were teaching political education programs. Compounding this issue was the limited contact between most party members and the party's main leader, Huey P. Newton. Members wanted to interact more with Newton, who they were told was constantly busy writing. After weeks of debate and individual lobbying from the Central Committee by members of Seal and Newton, the committee decided to close all chapters temporarily and dismantle them gradually over the course of the year. Newton had won the day by accepting Neal's recommendation to a staggered closing of the chapters and arguing that the party members would eventually take their new campaign skills, governing experience, and return to their home offices and replicate the Oakland experience and gain local power in their area. In the end, Seal accepted his view and threw himself into organizing Oakland and running for mayor. During 1972 through 1973, the Black Panthers converged on Oakland from all parts of the country. The Black Panthers concentrated the majority of his resources in Seal's mayoral bid and Elaine's Brown campaign for city council seat. The Panthers registered voters, distributed campaign literature, participated in campaign meetings and rallies throughout 19. 72 through 1973. But however, even though both races were extremely competitive, Seal and Brown lost their respective elections. The impact of this electoral defeat was devastating to the Panther Party because its members had invested so much time and effort into their campaigns. Shortly after the election, many Panthers resigned from the party because of the disappointment, exhaustion, and just general disillusionment. Their departure represented the second major exodus from the party, and according to Seal, the party only had about 500 members at this point. The 1970 three elections provided a critical mistake by the Panther Party's leadership and from that point on the party never recouped its size, prestige, or effectiveness. The party's future efforts remained confined to the Oakland Bay Area. Newton would continue his efforts to centralize power and authority within the Panthers, whereas party leaders would discipline members for violations of party rules in the early days. In the subsequent years, Newton began to assault party members and innocent bystanders at his own personal whim. These outbursts often occurred at his apartment or other Panther-owned or controlled establishments. Two such reports occurred in August 1973. In the first event, Newton was allegedly stepping out of his car on a Monday evening shortly after midnight and shot Kathleen Smith in the jaw for calling him a baby. Kathleen Smith was a prostitute that had been working on Oakland Street that evening with her friend Crystal Gray. The shot damaged Smith's spine and sent her into a coma. Three months later, she passed away. Gray was the only eyewitness and identified Newton as a murderer. Less than two weeks later, Newton pistol whipped Preston Collins in his own apartment. Collins was a tailor and had offered to make Newton some dress suits at a discounted price. During the conversation, Collins innocently and unknowingly of the first incident called Newton a baby and Newton became enraged and smashed his gun into the back of Collins' head and continued to brutalize him until Collins finally struck back and attempted to leave the apartment. Bleeding profusely, Collins stumbled out of the apartment only to be caught and forced back into the apartment where he was repeatedly tortured. Newton's behavior was partially a result of his serious alcohol and substance abuse problem. This had formed after his release from prison in 1970, and because of his legendary celebrity status, people rarely brought him alcohol, drugs, and other substances which he consumed. 
But during this time, the Panthers had more organizational issues also. In 1972, the Central Committee created the party's security corps. The original purpose was to provide security for the Black Panther leaders, and especially candidates for public office. In addition, Newton believed that to consolidate political power in the city of Oakland, the party would have to gain complete control of both legal and illegal affairs. This meant regulation of the city's vices or its underworld activities. Newton reasoned that the Oakland's criminal class would only resonate with the violence. So the party's security corps protected the party leaders while trying to force Oakland's criminal groups to pay the party for the right to continue their illegal activities. During 1973 to 1974, only Newton was aware of the full extent of the party's growing activities and multiple organizational units, which included political and extra political wings of the party. Even Bobby Seale, co-founder of the Black Panther Party, did not know the extent of Newton's substance abuse, extortion of local crime organizations, and misappropriation of party funds, and the violence against fellow party members and members of the black community. The Black Panthers' decline was only accelerated in 1974 with the departure of several key Panther members. Bobby Seale resigned in July 31st, 1974 after a major argument with Newton and other Panther members left the party shortly after Bobby Seale's resignation. Newton would go into exile in 1974 to avoid a series of felony counts that resonated from the murder of Kathleen Smith and the assault on Preston Collins. Newton would return to the United States three years later to face these charges on which he was acquitted after Collins changed his testimony several times and eventually told a jury that he didn't know who assaulted him. And Crystal Gray declined to testify against Newton after an apparent assassination attempt. In Newton's absence, Elaine Brown became the party's leader and managed to recruit some of the party's respectability. Brown appointed more women to the party's leadership positions and Erica Hudgens guided the communal schools and other black women such as Phyllis Jackson handled the financial and administrative tasks of the Black Panther Party. At this time, the party was no less than 200 members and had returned to its roots of local Oakland organization. Brown successfully secured local and private financial support of several Panther programs. In 1979, Elaine Brown ran for city council and finished second. However, her campaign was seriously hampered by drug charges and the accusations that she was involved in a murder of Petty Van Patter, a white woman who had been hired by the Panthers to put their financial records in order. During her leadership, the Black Panther Party played a key role in the election of the first black mayor of Oakland, Judge Lionel Wilson, in 1977. And at the same time, Brown continued the Black Panther's violent underground operations and tended to rely on corporal punishment to maintain authority over other Panther members. In 1977, Newton returned to the United States, and in response, Elaine Brown would resign from the party. She would also claim later that she had been beaten by Huey Newton. Following Newton's return, the security corps increased their involvement in criminal activities. Under Newton's guidance, the party would lose all its remaining legitimacy. In October 23, 1977, the security corps contributed greatly to the discrediting of the Panthers' remaining image by botching an attempted assassination of Crystal Gray, who was the only eyewitness to the murder of Kathleen Smith, and it resulted in the death of Panther Lewis Johnson and wounding another. These revelations, along with growth, financial mismanagement of private and government grants, the Panther Party discontinued several community programs in late 1970. And by 1980, the last issue of the Black Panther newsletter was published and their membership had dwindled to just 27 members. The Oakland Community School closed in 1982 due to lack of funding amid a scandal over Newton's embezzling of funds. This would mark the formal end of the Black Panther Party and they would officially dissolve in 1982. Huey Newton would be shot and killed in Oakland in the summer of 1989 in a drug-related incident. The Black Panthers emerged at a time of great political activity and excitement over the possibility of radical social change in the United States. In their work, the Panthers contributed significantly to making America more democratic and a more humane society. While the Panthers' rise was rapid and dramatic, its fall was slow and brutal. Ultimately, a mix of government repression, 
intra-organizational conflict and strategic mistakes destroyed the Black Panthers. But in their pinnacle, the Panthers confronted politicians, challenged police, and protected the Black community from brutality. The Black Panther Party led a movement to end police brutality and help organize civilian police review boards. The party's community service program provided clothing, food, and transportation, and the Black Panther Party's free breakfast program became a catalyst for the government's free meals program to poor school children. Rather than integrate with American society, the Panthers wanted to challenge and fundamentally change it, and to use black power as a means of global revolution. Even decades after their founding of the organization, the Black Panther's public image has survived in the United States and continues to resonate with current social movements and their experience provide guidance to a new generation of black activists. Thank you. I'm Country Boy, and this has been the Black Panther Party. If you like this, if you love this, please consider donating to our Patreon page. Also, you can find more episodes like this at onemikehistory.com and please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Peace.